Everybody, welcome to another installment of Show to Be with Mike G, the show of life, the show of Radiohead, the show of San Antonio and the Scotch whiskey. That's right. Today, I'm really excited to bring this chat. Coordinating with Karen Agalka from Compass Box to finally sit down with John Glazer. It took us about two years, but finally, we sat and we talked about everything. You know, I'm a huge fan of Compass Box, the creativity, the marketing, the branding, the aesthetic. And I imagined the man behind it would be nothing less than brilliant, just like the brand itself. And, you know, this conversation goes all over the place, literature, music, booze, punk rock, and everything in between. And of course, Compass Box Affinity is still my favorite bottle of the year. So this lines up just perfectly. So without further ado, I hope you guys enjoy this great chat with John Glazer of Compass Box. I think it was at Whiskey Fest. You were doing a presentation with your branding mates at Stranger and Stranger. Right. You talk about the first time you met them and Radiohead was playing. And then I saw another interview where you're being interviewed by a couple of Turkish men. And also <laughs> Radiohead is playing at the, the room. And I thought about how I was listening to the Benz just yesterday. And the band never knew what their purpose was. They just kept moving and then they ended up inadvertently innovating music. Right. You started this thing in 2000, 2001. You've rustled a lot of feathers. You've pushed your way through to have a seat at the table. Now, do you consider yourself someone pushing for innovation and actually pushing the envelope for the industry? I guess so. Yeah. I guess that's kind of what it all adds up to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I guess it's, it's, it's really just about... Um, I, I guess where it starts is like a massive respect, tremendous respect for all the traditions. Yeah. Right? Because one of the benefits of being in Scotch whiskey, as opposed to saying, say, trying to distill whiskey here in Texas and trying to make something that's of a place and when there isn't a tradition. Right. One of the benefits is people have done a lot of work before us to figure out what's good. Right what works and what doesn't and now it's I do think though that if you're in if you're able to be part of that tradition that in just this industry this that you have an obligation to you know do your part to make it stronger more relevant more compelling so that it, you know it, it, it lasts into the future yeah so is that answering the question? So that's why I guess what I think innovation is, is it's just the, to me, it's natural curiosity, but I think it's, it's really just trying to ask questions about, well, how can we do this better? Yeah. Yeah. Do you, each of the bottles aesthetically, fundamentally, tonally, or their own beings, their own records, their own concepts in a sense, right? Do you ever feel the pressure, like I would say Radiohead it did at one point, right? To reinvent yourself, challenge yourself and go in with no bearings whatsoever yeah i think that's i think yes is the answer um maybe not to as drastic a, an extent as they have <laughs> over the years i don't know <laughs> yeah. but um you know, we've never given away whiskey it's like you, you pay what you want for this bottle of whiskey right? <laughs> it's like yeah i guess that didn't work all that well but <laughs> but um yeah that's we we've we do change our recipes all the time we just changed peat monster and people yeah. are like well blends are supposed to be the same forever and ever and it's like well you know i reserve the right to make things better yeah if i find a way and we've changed packaging and design, label designs so many times over the years it's almost embarrassing but um i am kind of heartened when i think well you know actually mm -hmm. if you look at the music world mm -hmm. right every album in the you know if you think about albums uh -huh. as, as formats 
every album typically for most bands looks different it looks totally different in many Absolutely, almost yeah. all cases really and uh, it's few bands that you know maintain a theme throughout that you recognize album to album so I guess that's so that's made me feel better about our frequent changes and our look absolutely because it is read the color palettes are different the mm. textures the leafing just from an artistic perspective these are the mo most artful bottles i've ever seen you know and one of the things that's interesting is that by embracing tradition if you were to do that with the labels there would be flat text that all be black and white and it all look like it's a washed out map to some kind of hidden treasure mm -hmm. right is that also one of the things stylistically you think is very important that you offer is that I understand, respect tradition, but I also want to elevate it with design. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I can remember standing in the Kurgeleki Hotel bar in 1998 and looking around. I was on my own one night. Everybody else went to bed, and I'm still standing there with a the whiskey, looking around at the shelves of all, all the whiskeys. And back then, they had a, like, a lot of whiskeys, which would maybe not be as many today, but still. And I was thinking, all these malt whiskeys look like they, their labels were designed in the time of Queen Victoria. That's exactly. what you're saying, right? That's right, yeah. And I was just thinking, why is no one in this industry doing things differently or, mm -hmm. and doing anything that's more expressive or self-expressive? Right. Um, and I, you know, I, I can't... I wanted to be a winemaker when I got out of college, and so I was in that world for many years before getting into whiskey. And I, that world, even then, certainly today, is all about self-expression, mm -hmm. or so much more about self-expression than scotch. So yeah, and then two years later, I, I resigned from my job and started Compass Box, and came up, and we, we, did, we designed, Chris Evans and I designed this label with this woman's face on it and all this shit coming out of her head, and yeah. that was our first Compass Box label. So there was bit of self-expression <laughs> which is we can only hope that we find ourselves in our work and I think when we talk about it here shortly when you transition to being an entrepreneur ultimately that's a that's for you it's for us you know to mm. somehow to put ourselves in the, those bottles but I do wonder whether it's music whether it's literature which I've read you're quite a fan of or if there are any key aesthetic influences for you in the way that you view fashion the way that you view design Mm. any of those elements well, I do actually I mean I do look I mean I the world of music and how music is presented to the world mm. is an inspiration for me I mean songs can be inspirations we you know we named a whiskey flaming heart you know? <laughs> um, yeah, it was an M Ward M Ward's flaming heart oh was the inspiration okay but um yeah the world of music for sure in, in lots of different ways yeah um, like I, I already said, you know, the, the way album design is, is can be different, and um, uh, yeah, for, I mean that's. Uh, I, I looked the, the world of wine always gives me ideas, yeah. always kind of inspires things. Just reading about what producers are doing in their world, mm -hmm. um, and sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's just a, it, it, I might read something that inspires me, inspires a way to talk about what we do, not necessarily what how we make something or do something. Yeah. It's just ways of speaking about it. As um, um, who's the woman who makes Antica Terra in, in Oregon? Molly, Ma Maggie. In any case, she's a brilliant woman. I was listening. She was, I was listening to an interview of her recently, and she was talking about the way she describes her approach to winemaking, and it just the the, the way she talks about it was yeah. just like so enlightening to me. And I, I borrowed those those ways of speaking about things that's one of the things that I I understood about you before I met you sometimes the only way in which our lives are captured are by the way people talk about us mm. you know what, what what lives on of us yeah and so many people said you know it's just well spoken eloquent and they hang on your words much like a vocalist in a sense mm. right how do you like language mm. the mastery of language mm. do you Right? Do you think about how to deliver your t your points and your analogies? Do you, is that something that you hone and practice? It's something that's really important. For sure. It's fundamental, vitally important to what we do as a business, and I, well, that's what we, what we any business does or human beings do, I guess. Right? Yeah. Um, I guess, and I, I do practice it just through the work we do, through you know 
writing back label copy, um, mm -hmm. coming up with ways to describe what we do, writing people send me questions, they want me to reply, you know, interview questions. And so, yeah, I mean, right, language is really important to me. And I, as, I think as, as a lot of people, a lot of people like myself, I suppose, get older, language becomes even more important to you. Mm -hmm. And like, I still, like, I don't know, you should subscribe. I think you're the kind of person, you should subscribe to Merriam-Webster's Word of the Day if you don't. Oh, I do. <laughs> yeah. I, I certainly do. I mean, stuff like that, right? Yeah. And um, Lacrimose. Sorry, that's one <laughs> word. Yeah, there you go. I love that word. Right. It's just, it's singing, right? Yeah. Lacrimose, yeah. Right? And you can, and you can find it. Omnium gatherum. It. See, what is that? Omnium gatherum. I love that. You know, where'd that come from? No idea. It's a, it's it sounds know, like... Random collection of things or people. Yeah. And, uh, and suddenly, you, you, you're like, wait a minute, I can use that. So we have these demijohns, these big glass demijohns in different sizes, like up to like 15 liters or something yeah. in the office. And we fill them with whiskey, with samples, bottles that we don't need anymore. And they just kind of collect odds and ends, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> and uh, I've started calling them the Omnium Gatherum. People say, oh, what are those demijohns up there? I say, oh, it's, oh that's our Omnium Gatherum. And they're like, oh, <laughs> what the fuck is that? <laughs> And it is, so this it's in a teaching moment. Yeah, that, 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 it's great. Well, one, is it a hyphenated word? It's two words without a hyphen. Okay. The way I've seen it. But English, the way Mary Webster did it. Okay. Well, I suspect, strangely enough, <laughs> it seems very apropos for a batch of whiskey to name it as such. Yeah, right. <laughs> Just the odds and ends yeah. of things. Well, There's so a metal band somewhere out there in the world named Omnium. I think they're. Scandinavian omnium gatherum. Of course, of course, <laughs> <laughs> of course, <it's> <laughs> of course. <laughs> there's no other way. So we have, you know, this may be a concept record in front of me, myths and legends, right? Mm -hmm. Three parter. And so the way I wanted to kind of talk about it with you and learn about it, and we don't have to geek out. I just want to feel it and, and understand where it came from for you, maybe right. your inspiration, right? Yeah. So I want to do it in three parts. Okay. Past, present, and future. I don't know where the Danny Mall is. You'll fig we'll figure it out at some point. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it's we'll in the third out. act. So we're, the climax definitely is in the second act. <laughs> okay. so I'm sure of that 2000 year where you're kind of leaving Diageo and moving to this thing. But let's take a sip of this first one. I think this is, to, this is, are these considered chapters? Are they parts? They're parts, right? Part one, two, and three. Is that how you classify them? Yeah, well, yeah. We, we're not using the word part. Okay. We're just calling it Myths and Legends 1, Myths and Legends 2. Let's up so in one. Let's yeah, up exactly. Queen <laughs> <laughs> 2. Um, yeah. Um, so they're, they're, I guess in a sense, they're really more chapters if you th because they all kind of work together and they work in, uh, in sequential order. So this is perfect for a narrative. It is, okay. actually. Yeah. Th well, this is three part play, <laughs> three act play. <laughs> I'm no Oscar Wilde, I'll tell you that. <laughs> but I do fancy a drink now and again, much like the greatest playwrights of all time. All right, so this one is yeah, one. This is Myths and Legends one. Yeah. Myths and yeah. Legends one. And these are brand, brand new. Yeah, they've just, they've just come to the US. Yeah, just a few in the last several weeks. <laughs> Funnily enough, because they, they, two of these. All right, I'm going to jump right in. Sure, sure. Two of them are single malts. Ah, uh, first which time sounds ever, right? Like, 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 well, why, why would we do single malts? And I can explain that. But the cool thing, the goofy thing, actually, is they landed in New Jersey and cleared customs two days before the new 25% tariffs on single malt scotch went into effect. Oh. So we got right under the wire. That's, that is, <laughs> that's a hell of a note. And... Uh, <laughs> a shame, in a sense. Too. Well, that's, that's yeah. a you know what? Let's thing, not right? even go. No, I, I get it. I get it. But so, so what this? Yeah. Oh yeah, this is nice. It, 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 so why do we? Why would we do single malt? Right? Myths and legends. So at, okay, so the name. I remember the morning I was walking across Kew Bridge where I live and uh, over to the blending room. Saturday morning, and um, I was listening to some old REM music, and I was listening to the song. Uh, maps and legends. Okay. And I was just, and I, you know, and I was, so Stipe is singing Maps and Legends, and, and I'm thinking, it's kind of a cool name for a whiskey, actually. I'm not sure why, but it just sounds, sometimes things uh -huh. hit you, like, that's a cool, and I've got lists of ideas for names you know, that I, I keep. You get a journal? Uh, I do, oh, I keep, I don't, I do it on my laptop. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. 
and Maps and Legends, Maps and Legends. And then I was thinking, actually, Maps and Legends is kind of a stipian kind of <laughs> goofy twist on, 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 on common words or phrases. Right. And uh, so it's, you know, Maps and Legends probably would be too much, too clearly stolen from Michael Snipe. Sure. So then going, obviously what he was thinking of was Myths and Legends. And I was like, that is interesting. Uh -huh. Because what we could do with that is we could ch use this to challenge myths and I had this three-part idea anyway, and I was like, I just attached the whole thing together. Why was it three? I wanted to do a range. I've been wanting to do a, range, a, a release that is a range of products oh. to try to tell a story wow. um, for a while, as opposed to what we normally do is a limited edition is one whiskey, and here it is, bam, and this is what it's all about. Right. And, you know, everyone goes out and buys the bottle and drinks the bottle. And I wanted to do a range. Um, so this is, so I didn't have, a, the name kind of came from, well, from Stipe. Well, I love it because <laughs> you have the concepts in your head and then somehow the juice falls into place after. Yeah. You know? Because like, thematically, it's, it's not that you went in saying, well, this is the blend I want to make. Yeah. You're saying thematically, this is the, ca the theme I want to capture. This is the idea I want to yeah, get across, yeah. That's meta, man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> go on, go on, Which man. is a, a good, good thing. Well, all right, so this is the first time I'm trying this guy. Mm. I'll tell you what, man. One of the things I really love about all the compass box stuff is the nuance. You think you get it, mm. but it is incredibly complex and it yeah. exposes itself in different ways yeah. every single sip. Yeah. I compared it like Willem Dafoe. Right? He's like, oh, I got, I kind of understand. He's played some zany stuff. He's the zany guy, but then he plays like a nice dad or something. You're like, the range of this right you know what i mean yeah. the flexibility yeah i like i like elegance and i like nuance as you say and um um and i like things that kind of build slowly and kind of not in a pejorative sense but kind of creep up on you sure, you know, kind of sure. build and to suddenly realize wow that's actually quite special still i'm still thinking about that yeah you know that's haunting me in, in a positive way right mm -hmm. And I think this first one is a good example of that. So this is, this is a couple different parcels of casks from one distillery. Um, and what we're doing here is, 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 is showing people, or trying to illustrate to people, convey that even single malts, because that's what this is, are most often the product of blending. Mm -hmm. There is someone responsible for your favorite single malt, for that, whatever distillery it is, who is responsible for ensuring that their basic, their, their, their regular bottlings are consistent batch to batch. Or, you know, you look at Glenn Marangy and what Bill Umston and his team do there, you know, they are creating these variations of a single malt called Glenn Marangy that are blending different cask types very often, uh, yeah. right? Very different cask types. And, um, and it's, it's just what we do. It's just that they're sourcing all their casks from under one distillery roof, and we're just sourcing from a couple different Mm -hmm. Rubes, if you will. <laughs> but not in this case. This is actually, we decided, we, let's show the story here is, if you look, you know, look at the recipe on, on our website and stuff, you'll see that there are very different parcels, different ages, different cast types. And we didn't just bin, bish them all together. It was, you know, a considered process, mm -hmm. um, with James leading on this one, to create something that was created layers of complexity and balance. Is it an origin story? As you might find in Act One, an origin story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I suppose, yeah, you could say that it's single malt whiskey. Everyone knows what single malts are, but mm. let's see where it goes. That's right. <laughs> Which I think is the perfect segue. There's so much talk of wine and appreciation for that, but one of the things is you are a Midwesterner. Is that fair? Yeah, yeah. I was born in Detroit, and oh, really? And then, uh, yeah. I used Motor to live City. in Canton, or <laughs> I used to live in Detroit when I was a kid. Right? Yeah, okay. crazy. And then, you know, my dad moved around a little bit for his job. We had a stint in New Jersey. And then my formative years were spent in Minnesota. Mm. And then university in Ohio. Big Husker Du fan? Y yeah, yeah. I wouldn't say big, but certainly. Of the time, I suppose, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, God. Yeah. So, so much, such an important band, right? <laughs> <laughs> so the, when I think about creativity and I think about entrepreneurialism, I didn't want to think it came from anywhere in my family, right? But it, in fact, did. My mom was a nurse. That's why I'm always trying to take care of people, for, for better or worse. And my dad was always a restaurateur. Mm. And so that kind of 
impetus to try to create things and it came from some place yeah so you moving around a bit when you were younger that entrepreneurial spirit does that come from the family does it come from your father i think that moving around a lot when you're a kid does force you to learn to um figure out how to get along with people Mm -hmm. yeah or certain depending on your personality type i suppose but for me i think it did you know um, having to figure out how to f- make new friends, right? And you know, you move from a place like New Jersey in the late seventies, as I did, to Minnesota. Mm-hmm. They, they were like different planets yeah. <laughs> in a way. <laughs> you know, not you know the accents and cultural things. I remember going to school the first day and whatever it was eighth grade or seventh grade, and it was like um, uh, eighth grade. And uh, these, I thought everybody mi- mixed up my name because they kept calling me Jan. Jan. I was like, they think my name is Jan. J A N. And I was just like, okay, well, I'm this kid from New Jersey. <laughs> I've been living in New Jersey. Anyway, and I just wasn't understanding the accent. So you have to learn, yeah. right, all this stuff. I, it's, it's a very, I, f- I know exactly how you feel. I moved around at least six times before I was 16. Mm. School right. to school yeah, yeah, yeah. to school. Yeah. I find that, and tell me if this, you found this as well, you can rely on your family always, but mm-hmm. then you have to rely on yourself. Mm-hmm. Did you spend a lot of time solitarily, maybe reading and writing? These are the ways I kind of cope with it, yeah. trying to kind of adapt. Yeah. Well, I, in, my, I'm, in my memory, yes. I, but was that just because I was a teenager? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. But yeah, I had the, the basement bedroom, right? And I was the oldest in the family, so I would just go down there and put the headphones on and yeah. do whatever I was doing. But um, uh, yeah, I think um, there was something about, I think, my dad who... who um, he was in, he was always in sales and marketing, and this whole thing was you know everyone's a salesman. Even if you want to pursue a creative you know endeavor, a creative mm-hmm. livelihood, you're always going to have to sell yourself. And that was something he taught us as when we were growing up, and we were like, yeah, right, Dad. But um, I think it, it did have an effect. And I remember my, my very, the very first business I ever wanted to start was um, I was working for this flower shop delivering flowers in in Wyzetta where we lived in. And I thought, this is really cool. I would go try, drive their car to pick up the flowers at the wholesaler, and I would see the invoice, and the roses cost like, you know, 25p, 25 cents each. Yeah. I would take them back to the store, and we would put them in this, this bucket, and we'd put them out for sale, and we would charge $2. I was like, <laughs> wait a minute. You know, it's a profit thing. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, but that's a w- not everybody has that notion, right. especially not as a kid. So in a, some sense, I, I really do feel it bubbles up from within us. We yeah. kind of learn it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Talking about higher ed, was there any expectation that your career was going to be more successful if you went to college? Sometimes that was an expectation for me. Yeah, definitely in my family it was an expectation. Um, that, was the, that was the goal, really. Yeah. Yeah, that was the goal is you know, you're just going to go to college and because you know, a good college meant you, were, you would be able to get a good job. Right, right. You know? Which is a weird sentiment now. It's kind of shifted a little bit. Yeah, right? definitely. It's a different era. For sure, um, but that's certainly the way the way it was for us. Um, yeah, math guy. Now I, I've I've heard you don't like numbers. I've heard that you do like marketing. They're all over the place, all over the map here. But when it comes down to it, you history English guy in college or math and science? I was an uh, in English guy, uh, literature major. Any Spe- specialty? Um, I liked modernists mm. yeah american modernists yeah that whole thing i liked uh um i liked how it was such a, a major sort of sea change from what had gone on in the late 19th century and and uh, and then of course there were more records of the individuals you know there was photography and stuff and yeah. and, and and even films of and, and so you could get a better sense of who the the the, the well-known authors were as, as individuals yeah compared to, compared to reading biographies of people in the 19th 18th centuries so that's captured my imagination um any but any particular renegades from that I, I, is hemingway a modernist yeah Steinbeck, hemingway's yeah hemingway's Faulkner, done, yeah things. all modernists yeah and uh, all of those you know especially faulkner especially hemingway and mm. you know but for me it was just structurally what the way they were writing was so different yeah. and so beautiful at the same time for to me, that it, it really just captured my imagination. And also, it was also about exposing, uh, it was, it's more psychological literature than you know, what had gone on before, and that was, you know, it was deeper than what had gone before, arguably in that sense. And sure. it was 
just all, altogether more compelling for me. What did you hope to do with the degree? Did you want to teach? Did you want to? No, I didn't, ever th I didn't ever think about teaching, although I really do later now in my life, I do enjoy teaching, actually. I mean, yeah. teaching whiskey <laughs> yeah. classes, I mean, for example, and stuff like that. I, I go to St. Andrews University almost every year in Scotland. Oh, cool. I, almost every year since I started Compass Box, I've yeah. gone. And I just love it. And I was, uh, I was just at Harriet Watt University in Edinburgh a couple weeks ago. I love getting in front of doing whiskey events in front of students because they're just so much more interested mm -hmm. in what you have to say than like, you know, a bunch of middle-aged guys. <laughs> but uh, where was I? Was so I, it, yeah. in a sense, you are a teacher. I mean, that's, I think, quite yeah, in a sense. fundamental yeah. element of any of like the dinner this evening, happy hour, yeah. you kind of have your... I enjoy that, yeah. I mean, when I got in the wine business, I was working in retail and wine. I really enjoyed helping people Demy helping demystify wine for people and yeah. making them happy and that kind of stuff. And but when I was in university, I wasn't ever th thinking about teaching. I enjoyed writing, and so studying modernist and creative writing and all that stuff. And um, and I thought, yeah, I'm going. I, I was I, back then when you're you know 20 years old, yeah. you you know you uh, you're extra naive. And uh, yeah, I thought, well, okay, I could I could write. But I didn't have the right kind of focus, I think, to, or discipline to, to be a writer. Yeah. Um, I really enjoy the idea of capturing things and trying to capture things in a compelling way for other people to read, but yeah, I wasn't really a writer personality, so when I got a, I took a wine class when I was a senior at, <laughs> at Miami of Ohio where I went, and, the, and it was geography credit, which I needed, <laughs> okay. and, uh, and I fell in love with wine. I was like, wow, this what is it, what fascinating. What about it? I think w it was it was about it was about this this thing that that culturally um, is so important, you know, all over the world, yeah. but in different ways. Um, that is this thing, this craft, this thing that people make mm -hmm. largely with their hands, right? Um, and it's this this beverage that's you know about sharing, and I was getting into like cooking, and then and and. That was all really captivating me. Plus the way, way it makes you feel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Always the best part in yeah. a sense, right? You get all this passion that's punctuated by a nice little feeling as well. Yeah, exactly. And so that's, that's what drew me into wine. And I thought, yeah, I'd, I'd like to make wine. You know, it's like, yeah, I'm, I'm, this is what I want to do. So I took the advice of my wine professor, Dr. Dome, and I, I went and got a job in retail wine first to try to, because he said, go there and for a year and a couple of years, and people would all, people would be bringing you wines to taste yeah. and be learning con every day. Is that shop still around? Uh, it's not. It was called Mayflower Wines and Spirits, M Street, New Hampshire, in Washington, D.C. Oh, wow. A long time ago. Yeah. Yeah, that was a really, really formative years for me. Yeah. All, all the famous wine personalities that would come in and out of that store is owned by this brilliant woman named Sydney Moore, and I learned so much from her. Um, not just about retail, but about business and about wine, of course, as yeah. well. She was a real influence on me back then. But so yeah, wine. You, did you eventually go get your hands dirty at a vineyard? And I did. That part yeah, I did just kind of casually. So I went to Burgundy. I went to France for almost a year, studied, took a three-month intensive course in French in Dijon, and then, then started knocking on doors in, in August, September, mm -hmm. during, as harvest was about to start, to try to find somebody who would let me pick grapes with them. And I knocked on this guy's door, Bruno Claire. I knew his name from selling the wines in Washington, D.C. And, and uh, he took me on. And I spent like three weeks picking grapes with oh him wow. and his team. And then I was, I, I was having fun and I was enjoying it. So he let me stay on and help him make wine. And, you know, I lived above the winery in this drafty old uh, room. And, yeah, it was like I was living, my, living the dream. That kind of sounds like the dream. <laughs> I don't know where that chapter is for me. I need that chapter, you know, <laughs> some drafty, stodgy kind of spot, right? But that's it. I think what, what what's happened for me personally when you think about categories, it starts somewhere, and it always goes wider. The mm. lens, exit, excuse me, enter stage left, whiskey, enter mescal, rum, yeah. brandies, and all all this stuff. So, what was the next big world that you were trying to explore? I think it, it was business. Oh, interesting. Okay. I think I came back from France and was working in a store in Connecticut now, um, saving up my money to go to California, University of California, Davis, to mm. study, get into the Enology Viticulture Program, and I was, that was going to be the plan. 
and I was working for someone who, another person who has become, still to this day, really a real mentor for me, uh, Peter Holt. And uh, he was saying to me at the time, after we got to know one another after a couple of years, we were opening a new big new wine store together. I was working for him and he said, you know, John, you know, you'd be better off rather than going to California and standing at the end of a long line of guys trying to make wine. You, your personality, you're, you'd be better off on the business side of wine. Mm. And he got me starting to think about wine as a business and not just this beverage that this intellectual pursuit, right? Right, right. Um, and, and that triggered something in my brain. Um, and I took his advice and I went back to school and I got a business degree. And I came out of school and didn't get any jobs in the wine industry. And eventually I got a job offer from this brand called Johnny Walker. Yeah. I New think York. some and have heard <laughs> of that one. I mean, I, I, I haven't heard of it, but I've heard of White Walker. Is that the same thing? That's exactly. <laughs> yes. That's, that's uh, the more famous uh, yeah, one. So, so this chapter with whiskey kind of begins. So let's call this the second act. Yeah. So let's try this second mark. Number two okay. of Myths, Myths and, and Legends. Myths and Legends yeah. Which for Zeppelin was a better record. For yeah. Queen it was a better record. <laughs> for sure. For sure. <laughs> Who else we got? Ah, those are the two main ones. I think you called it with Queen. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about how the narrative drives forward with two. Yeah, this one, again, this is also a single malt scotch whiskey. Right? So it comes from one distillery, which is not what we normally do. We're normally blending whiskeys from different distilleries. But with this one, um, the story here is that the myth that we want to pe challenge for people is the myth of regionality in Scotch whiskey. Mm. <coughs> Excuse me, that this myth that certain, uh, the, the, like wine, a region produces a certain style. <coughs> um, and what that really is, the truth is that you can make any style of, of whiskey anywhere in Scotland. Mm -hmm. There are some local customs, things like making heavy, heavily peated malt whiskeys on the island of Isla, for example. It's a local tradition, custom. Sure. But you can make, can make it any style of whiskey anywhere. And the, the idea of terroir as it applies to the wine world does not apply to Scotch whiskey, despite what marketers over the decades have tried to suggest that Speyside whiskeys taste like of this, mm -hmm. and, 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 high, and Northern Highland whiskeys taste of this, and Island whiskeys taste of that. Lowland whiskeys taste like this. That's, it's really just marketing. Mm. Which so you knew quite yeah. well. What we're trying to do here is show people that, well, okay, this whiskey, this single malt whiskey does come from the Speyside region, mm -hmm. but it doesn't have the kinds of aromas and flavors that you know, people write about or marketers talk about space I'd supposedly having you get this uh, rather than having <laughs> and I love it when people talk about this whiskey smells of Heather because I, I don't know if everyone's ever really smelled Heather and and, 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 and I don't I, I just I don't I don't buy the whole Heather thing in, in, in whiskey myself but um, what you're getting here is almost tropical in, a, yes. in, a, in a fruit aromas which is not something you associate with, you know, people talk about, you know, delicate fruitiness and heather frequently in space side whiskey, but that's just marketing stuff. And, mm -hmm. and this kind of, yeah, I mean, let's pay to that. I don't know if it's papaya thing or mango things I do actually eat. Yeah. <laughs> I do. yeah. And what, what's really driving those kind of complex aromas and flavors is the way the casks worked with the spirit over time, mm. the types of casks um, that, Someone at the distillery, representing the distillery, chose years ago, um, you know, 15, 20 years ago. There's whiskeys in here of various ages. So, yeah, it's, it's not about regionality. It's not about, oh, this region, they taste like this. It's, it's really about the decisions that makers have made mm -hmm. in the process of creating the whiskey. You know, the kinds of, the, the way the barley's malted, smoked or not. Um, yeasts, uh, how long the fermentation is, uh, how long fermentation lasted, the way they managed distillation, the size and shape, of course, of the stuff, and uh, really importantly, the types of casks they choose to put yeah. the whiskeys. All those decisions, at all those decision points, there's a person or maybe a team of people mm -hmm. making uh, decisions about what they want to produce. And in an ideal world, and it doesn't always work like this because some distilleries are not every distillery and people in charge of it think this way, but in an ideal world, at least for me, you're making those decisions all along the way 
mm. with a vision in your mind of what you want your whiskey to taste like in the future. Sure. This is, if in fact one was the origin story where it begins, this has experienced some things. This is more dark and brooding, yeah. but still sensitive. You know what I mean? Like, it got roughed up a bit. Yeah. But still very elegant and eloquent. Yeah, we're into more depth here. Um, it, it's a more, it's a, I would argue, a more challenging whiskey than one. Mm -hmm. No less charming and delicious. Uh, but yeah, now we're, we're moving into some deeper territory here. Mm. Myths and legends. What was the moment? I hear the story that you pitched this idea, ultimately gave free ideas to your parent company, that's our Diageo at that time, and they just weren't particularly interested in building blends. Mm. If that's historically true. But was that the moment where you said, this has to be done, I'm going to have to do it myself? Mm. Man, scorn, in a sense. Yeah, I think and people ask me frequently, you know, how did you decide to start your own business? And, or how will I know, you know, how do I know when it's the right time or I'm afraid to do it or whatever? And my response to those kinds of questions and comments is, if you're asking me for my opinion, then it's that one day you just wake up and you know, this is what I have to do. Right. You know, if I don't do this, I'm going to be unhappy every day of my life forevermore when I think about not having done it. <laughs> Absolutely. So you're compelled at some point. And so, yeah, so I, I presented it long ago. This is what, tw over 20 years ago now. Presented the idea of Compass Box. It wasn't even called Compass Box then. But the idea of a little boutique-y uh, craft, whatever you want to call it. We, we called it back then. Yeah, the Blending House, yeah. right? That was all about quality and making whiskeys that stand shoulder to shoulder with the great single malt whiskeys of Scotland but through using blending as our platform for creativity, for creating things that were ours mm. and that were delicious. And the response was, nice idea, but it'll never be big enough for, for our business. And I understood that. It didn't make sense for them then. It wouldn't make sense for them today, if you ask me. But um, that left me thinking. And I kind of realized I was on the island of Eleuthera with, uh, with my Amy and my friends Gretchen and Jeff, and we were, and then, you know, what vacations are really supposed to be places where you t times when you can like just completely decompress uh -huh. and let your brain go right and rum punch is, is <laughs> helpful to that and there was just a, a day literally I can remember it on the beach I was like hey you know I just have to do this myself I'm just gonna do it myself yeah you know why I'm, I'm you know, frustrated they didn't want to do it but somebody should do it and I kind of realized that my whole kind of path or journey up to that point was kind of in a sense, training me for it. You know, I started in the wine business, and I knew retail. I worked for a small wholesaler mm -hmm. in wine as well. I'd gone to I'd produced, gone to France, and you know, worked in w winery and seen wineries, and and um, had also did a summer in Napa subsequent to that, and and um, and then I was in, worked in marketing, so I understood marketing and, and sales and, and, and how it all, and I understood pro production because when I was in London, I was in charge of product development. And so I kind of understood stood all the pieces. And I was in, in product development times, in pro my time in product development, I was working with some of the legends in our industry, you know, Maureen Robinson, Jim Beveridge, mm. and learning what blending was really all about and the creative potential of it. And blending whiskeys at home as a hobby. I mean, I started to geek out on that, you know, yeah, on my, on my own time, but I just realized I, I kind of understand it's at a certain at an essential, but basic level how yeah. to do all the stuff. Is it kind of strange that you may think things are inconsequential, yeah. you're just in the moment doing a thing? Oh, I just, yeah. I don't know. I was working at Best Buy for six years, which actually happened, but it all ends up being combined in a culmination. Yeah, you know. Hang on. I what do you got? What do you got? Exactly. <laughs> He's ruffling around, and I don't know what. To so there is a, this great Tom Waits quotation that I've loved since I first read it in like 1995 or something in the New York Times. He just released uh, that sort of opera he did with a German composer. I'm probably getting this wrong, but anyway, he was in the interview, uh, somebody was asking him about 
Well, asked him a question. Hang, hang. It's coming. Yeah. Well, the, the thing is, while you're looking yeah. for this, some of the voice and some of your timbre reminds me of Tom Waits. <laughs> 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 I mean, you need to smoke about 10 packs a day for a yeah. little while, yeah. but there's something really deep and sultry about that too, which I think is the hopefully here dot 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 ellipses into your favorite quote. So he said, that which you accumulated without knowing it becomes your real treasure. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. That's that, and I've kept, I've got the actual New York Times clipping from that uh, all these years later. And it's still, you know, it's still, it's, you know, I still think about it. It's still an important thought. That's it, exactly. You know, you asked me earlier, what do I do? I don't know. I'm just doing things. And I don't know where I'm going, but I'm set sail. And everything along the way, the people that I meet and the places that I go, that's what's really rich. Yeah, yeah. So you've been known, you know, this is a really hip term, right? Disruptor. <laughs> but did you feel any obligation? Like an album from <laughs> ZZ Top that never came out. <laughs> well, it could be the sequel to Violator from, from Depeche Mode too, right? Like, but did you ever feel an obligation... I'll, I'll rephrase it. Was it more being dedicated to truth and tradition or was it more being dedicated to upheaving and kind of shaking these notions that are untrue about whiskey? In other words, disrupting the mm. industry. It's a punk rock mentality. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, yeah I guess, <clears throat> I guess it, it, it is a punk rock mentality. My, you know, my good friend Mike Miller and I had a lot talked a lot about what punk means and the ethos of punk is a couple of years ago when we were working on the second Delilah's collaboration and uh, we wrote about that and at the time and uh, yeah there is definitely a, a sort of punk disruptor ethos in what we do but where I'll go with that is to not kind of dif differentiate maybe some would argue this might not be the case but strains of punk right mm. and then some are you could argue are just rebels for rebels black flag black flag good example just trying to piss people piss people off yeah, make, right? yeah. make people uncomfortable throw a punch yeah, yeah. but then there there's a, I think there's a difference between being a rebel and being a heretic okay wow or okay. A, you know some punks are just are her i would argue you could argue, are heretics so they're they're challenging the status quo, uh -huh. right? no pun intended. They're challenging dogma, but they're really trying to make beautiful, compelling, albeit loud, music. Sure. Do you have any? I, I've got one example, but do you have an example of who you feel well, falls into? Well, I, I think I, I would argue. Uh, well, Husker Du could fall into that. Okay. Sure. Well, there's yeah. lots of things that Bob challenged. You yeah. Know, yeah, but problem. at the end of the day, he's like he was like. Paul McCartney in terms <laughs> of like, you know, being able to write. Soft heart, good melodies. Well, uh, melodies, yeah. 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 I, uh, Clash, maybe. Okay. You know? Oh, sure. Maybe Joe Strummer. Uh, yeah, I think that's, that falls kind of into that area. I think bad religion in some sense kind of does, yeah. but they, more social change rather than cultural right. change. Slight differentiator. So, so I'm, I'm more the heretic side. Yeah, I'm not a rebel because I really, everything we've ever done in terms of challenge that's been documented in you know, the, 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 the whiskey or the trade press, you know, w use of flat oak staves, uh, you know, 15, 16, 17 years ago, um, our challenge to the, 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 the category definitions, blended malt, scotch whiskey, mm -hmm. 10 years ago, our transparency campaign, three years ago, um, for the right, not the obligation, but the right to, you know, be fully open about the ages of all the whiskeys in our blends. All those things have been with the best interests of the industry in mind. Not because we're trying to make trouble yeah. or stand out. You know, it's not been about rabble rousing. Mm -hmm. um, it's really more about trying to do the right thing for the everybody. Yeah. So the industry, I argue, looks stupid when you say, I'm sorry, I can't tell you the age of all the whiskeys in the blend because there's a law that's protecting you. You know, that's just making the industry look silly if you ask me. It should change, yeah. therefore. And uh, so that's why we took up that campaign. So. Heretic. There are, there are heret really heretics with a positive way. intent. Yeah, well, that's the thing <laughs> is that you, you look at the 80s, and obviously NWA was bad. Like, there's the, the Tipper Gore 
organization with you know the, there's so many bad bands or devil worshipers and all that but then you realize like how important that music really is and it's really just in your life where you kind of look at where that angle is mm. now i appreciate the descendants mm. or you know but it's one of those things that punk changes it almost gets assimilated into forward thinking mindedness as you get older mm-hmm. yeah is your i wouldn't call it obligation but is your movement your essence of being a heretic will that ever and can that ever end oh, i think it's hardwired in yeah when i was in sixth grade they made the boys and girls take gym class together oh, after wow. having keeping them separated for all the uh, four years before and and uh todd baker and i thought this sucks because you know the girls weren't as good at sports as we were right sure, right, right i know i'm, I'm joking and as i look over at karen and <laughs> I <laughs> smile about this. So Todd and I took matters into our own hands. We started a petition. Got everybody in the class except one girl to sign it. Took it to the Board of Education. Like one night, you know, my mom had to drive me to the Board of Education so I could present this petition. It's like, we want separate gym classes. And they said, no, we lost. <laughs> one small step. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were. We were yeah. So let's. I was 12. But that, I mean. <laughs> I was 11, actually. <laughs> Not a lot of us are writing anything of any kind of formation at 11. So, you know, well done on that. And I suppose the journey has yet to really, truly start. Every chapter, right? It's like a new thing to learn, new places to be. So I want to see, because this being a narrative, Led Zeppelin Three was a very landmark record for them. <laughs> Every immigrant song leads right. that thing off, man. I mean, this is it's a great, great record. Let's now taste Myths and Legends. Okay. Which I'm getting the sense of narrative so far. So this I really do appreciate. Your cinematography in a sense. Oh, geez. Okay. Yeah. So Myths and Legends 3. Now now we've we started off Myths and Legends 1 and 2 were single molds, challenging, you know, commonly held ideas about Scotch whiskey and how it's made or what Scotch whiskey tastes like from different places. Well, with the third one, um, we're just, I, we are challenging, as we have been for 19 years, this idea that great malt whiskeys, great single malt whiskeys should never be blended together. They should always be able to stand on their own mm-hmm. and all this stuff and, and uh, you know, respect the sanctity of the single malt kind of, kind of stuff. It's a good title of a book, though. <laughs> <laughs> And so here we're blending. So now we've got two single malts, and the third in the range is a blended malt, or vatted malt, the old-fashioned term for when you blend single malts with no grain whiskey, just blending single malts. And what we've done is we've taken some of the parcels from Myths and Legends too, mm. and we've built on those with some, some other whiskeys, bringing in some peated whiskeys, and created something that, of the three, stands out for uh, more explosive aroma and... Um, smoke uh, and fruit and when you get it on the palate still this sweetness and this you know almost ethereal mm. character that will you know kind of echo in your in your in your mouth after you've swallowed it this long finish but now you're we've, we're into real complexity mm-hmm. it's a serious complexity and uh, a bigger whiskey uh, than the others but it's a blend mm. but it's a blend it's just a blend. <laughs> so trying to make the point that, yeah, blending is a way, a pla- can be a platform for creativity, a way to make compelling whiskeys, a way to make whiskeys that stand, you know, amongst the, the, the greatest in, in, in Scotch whiskey, I believe. This has truly been a narrative. Hmm. You know, it started in a place, and as I've had these moments with you two, I've chan- you know, this is the thing about a lot of these conversations is, we're never twice the same and you know 47 minutes later or whatnot we've went through kind of this journey together the underlying depth of the peat mm. it's just beautifully supple and supporting the other lighter yeah. higher yeah. flavors nice way to describe it yeah but it's it's still there yeah you know it's kindness yeah but again struggle there's yeah. a balance yeah there. nice yeah yeah this is still this is not a shouty whiskey this is not in your face there's still a suppleness as you say yeah. to it um, and I would argue an approachability even though there's quite a lot of complexity uh, on in, the, in, in, in there underneath the surface yeah 
Yeah. This it really truly feels like an evolution of a single yeah. melody. Yeah. You know, yeah. like acoustic all the way to operatic queen breakdown of Bohemian <laughs> Rhapsody style, <laughs> <laughs> where the tape has been recorded through so much, but it's still all there. You know? So uh, this is, and this is what we like to do is create. I mean, what we do is not just. It's not. It's not. It is primarily about the liquid, but it's not just about the liquid. You know, the names, the the package design that 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 goes around it, the the, 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 the graphic design, the the, the ideas, the, the ex- explanations, the stories behind the making of these things. It's all a, all a holistic endeavor to create something special. It is. Um, um, you familiar with this Japanese term, manuzukuri? Mm, I've heard Mano of it. Manuzukuri. It's mm-hmm. this. This idea of, uh, well, my interpretation, understanding of it is this idea of craftsmanship, uh-huh. but not, not, not the idea of a, the sole craftsman, you know, banging away in, in his or her studio right. day after day. It's this idea of, of a holistic endeavor, the making of something that is holistic and, uh, and from in, in, uh, a collaboration of people mm-hmm. to make something important. This idea of monozukuri, which I kind of uh, love because that's really what we do. It's not, these are not just made by me. You know, there's a whole team. There are 19 of us in our company, yeah. you know, and there are four of us who are part of the whiskey making team. And, you know, Jill, James, Elif, myself, we all play a role. And, and not just, you know, other people will inspire uh, uh, things that end up, you know, becoming whiskeys too. It's a collaboration, and it is this whole almost every bottle represents, every product represents its own little kind of poetic little biosphere. It does feel like the culmination of multiple passions. This is one of the things that, as I think about blend, now I think that blending is the perfect way. It's a maestro, it's a compositional way to Mm. get flavors that you Mm. want. It's an additive process in some sense, right? Mm -hmm. But perhaps these blends more represent and are more of a metamor- metaphor for you and your team, that it is different people, different backgrounds, different mm-hmm. places, all coming together in such harmony and causing such a fuss with the industry. That's, that's a hell of a metaphor. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I guess, yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah, fuss for the industry, but also at the end of the day, it's really, we're trying to create, make the world of whiskey a more interesting place, and, then, and in doing so, bring more people into it. Into Absolutely. You know, experience the joys of this stuff. That's why we exist. So I've got two questions left for you, John, before we retire off into the happy hour here, just around the corner. The first one is, and normally I ask it kind of generally, but for you, given the focus on writing and English, let's say you're sipping Myths and Legends 3 with any deceased writer (laughs) anywhere in the world, who would you love to have a dram with? And a conversation. Um, I just reread, reread *Movable Feast* mm. a couple, several months ago, earlier in the year. And uh, yeah, I don't know how many times I've read it, but um, uh, and it it made me actually think, where's my mem- memoir? <laughs> I better get going. <laughs> um, but I don't know, it just brought me back to Hemingway, and, and it just, it, I, I know so many young aspiring writers, especially in my generation, you know, idolized him, but uh, there was just something about not just his view of the world, which was, and his, and his ability to put that into prose, yeah. which was, you know, a greater power than most people had at that time, but also the, this, the, the sort of the drama of his, the curse of being who he was. Inner turmoil. Yeah. yeah. Um, which I think makes him such a fascinating character. But then he had so many interests that I love to this day. Yeah. Traveling the world, um, getting out fishing. And I do, you know, I grew up in the Midwest primarily, and my father taught us to, you know, to, 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 to hunt. And I, I still enjoy that stuff. I, not so much for the you know, bringing back the meat or the fish, but for being out there with people mm-hmm, my, um, mm-hmm. in, or being out there in, in, in the world in, in a beautiful place and then sharing it with, with other folks, with, you know, my family, my brothers, for example. And uh, 
and food and wine. Yeah, you know, he was apparently known for. <laughs> I heard he rum. Drank a bit. Yeah, <laughs> rum. So I'll I'll go with I'll go with that one. Yeah, it's an interesting because it's a different take on mm. Hemingway. When mm. other folks have answered that question, it's because they merely would like to have a well be drank under the table by him, I suppose. <laughs> but he was yeah. so much more than that. A fighter, inner tor- you know, all of these things. Such a complex, complex yeah. man. So the last question I've got for you here in San Antonio tomorrow, you're off to Houston. Yes. Is this can we call this the Myths and Legends Tour? Is that what <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I guess we can. It's so rock and roll. <laughs> I mean, that's more. To say, though. Yeah, <laughs> Legends Tour. <laughs> I'm trying because it's like, it, it's good, but I got to, yeah. there's sibilance and all this stuff. But it feels like it. Yeah. You're on stage much. tonight here, actually, in a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. Well, it's what I do. Good. It's been such a pleasure sipping through these three. Thank you. You know, one, two, and three. I, I'm going to say it. I think I'm probably the lucky. This is the best way to do it. Sit here, talk about life, and sip through these amazing drams. Your contributions to whiskey have been monumental. And I thank you. And I know a lot of people really appreciate you driving the industry to be more honest about stuff. Yeah, no fucking reason not to be. Yeah? I agree. Thanks so much, John. I'll see you soon. Thank you. So there we have it, the modern iconoclast himself, Mr. John Glazer of Compass Box. What do you guys think? Deeply intelligent, deeply interesting, and perhaps one of the few modern iconoclasts of whiskey. His creativity, his branding is always a huge inspiration in sipping through myths and legends with him. One, two, and three. Brilliant narrative, brilliant progression, and delicious, delicious whiskey. John, Karen, thanks so much for coordinating and taking the time out to chat with me. I think we're all very, very excited and wait in anticipation to see what you do next. So thanks, everybody, for listening to Show to V with Mike G. No matter how many baking shows you can watch because there's a U.S. version of the British Baking Challenge now on Hulu. Or if you're thinking, man, The Good Place is a good show, but when will it return back on TV? Please keep dancing.